I want to preach on the Joshua generation tonight for just a few moments. I won't keep you long. And it's not because we're in a hurry. I'll tell you that right now. It's not because we're in a hurry. And it's not because I'm hurrying up to get home to pick my favorite team. I don't have a favorite team. There's one I have a little preference with, and they're just down the road. Well, that's the way it ought to be. This is where we grew up at. But truthfully, I'm in it to win it. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's get with it. Hallelujah. And after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, and here's what he said. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, rise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. I want everybody to read verse number six together. I've read enough. I just feel like y'all need to shout that out. Are y'all ready? Everybody read with me verse number six. Everybody ready together? Be strong and of good courage for unto this people... Now, I want you to look at your neighbor and I want you to tell him, be strong and of a good courage. For unto us, the Lord is dividing up an inheritance. He is giving us land that he swear unto our fathers to give us in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God, for your word and your blessings in the name of the Lord. And let everybody say amen. Let everybody shout amen. amen. Hallelujah. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm always thankful and grateful for the history in which I have over 53 years now lived through. I'm thankful for the God moments. I'm thankful for the high times. I'm thankful for the in-between times, and I'm thankful for the growth that only the valley could create. I'm thankful there were times I struggled. It created strength. I'm thankful for the times that the Lord allowed me to see what it was like to walk without him and to see what it was like to have his hand up over my life. I'm thankful for the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I'm thankful that I saw the last generation from the lens of a very young set of eyes. From the time I was little, before I was ever 10 years old, six, seven, eight years old, I can remember my dad buying an old Ford Econoline. It had the flat nose. It had the big two windows divided by, seemed like a piece of perhaps something was there, aluminum, steel, all meshed together, and you had that old, I can still picture it. Didn't have any seats in it. He had plywood on the back of it, and when he wasn't driving the bus, he He'd get that old Ford van out. We'd go around and pick up some of our family and friends, our cousins, people in Dayton, and we'd go to the holiness church. When I say holiness, I do not use that term lightly. I mean they were holiness. Their sleeves were going to be down past that little knob, that little bone on your wrist. I'm not a doctor. That's just what we call it from the pulpit. They had dresses clear down to the floor, and I can remember the services that we were a part of. I've seen the demons come out. They got cast out. They didn't get counseled out. They got cast out. Praise God. You stayed and you prayed till you got prayed through. Hallelujah. They had an amen corner on the right side of the stage. That's the first time I really got truly got saved. I got up there when I was about seven, eight years old. As I recollect, I remember kneeling down. I said, God, I want what these people have. I want this joy. I want this peace. And my last request was, I said, God, I want to cry a little bit too. I want to feel what they feel. I'm telling you, as quick as it came out of my mouth, crossed my mind, little tears began to flow down my face. I got up from there so surprised, so happy, but yet anticipating. Ran over to my daddy. I said, Dad, something happened to me tonight. God got a hold of me. I said, I got saved, Dad. I gave my life to the Lord. I said, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I got saved. I mean, in the old time way and the old order of services. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, it's been an experience to watch some of those old preachers from Charlie Pennington. 
I remember watching him, observing him, from him to my dear pastor, Norman Livingston. Hallelujah. Watch him preach under the power. Watch the Holy Ghost get a hold of him. I'm telling you right now, bless his soul in heaven, he's a closet Pentecostal. I'm just telling you right now. I mean, he, he had the back, Baptist backing and he had the independent backing, but I'm not going to say anymore. I watched the Spirit of God move on him. I watched God help him. That's just my humble opinion. Don't get me in any trouble for saying that. Hallelujah. From there, I've been handed from one pastor to another that's really put their hands on my life, counseled me, helped me. I hate to use words like mentor, but there's really not a more respectful word than to say that, that I've been mentored and helped by great men of God that wanted an investment in my life, that had nothing in it for themselves. They just wanted to put their hands on me and help me. They just wanted to guide me in the right direction. I know all of them had good intentions. There were some of them that didn't. There were some of them that were mean and hateful, and I learned things off of them too. What not to do and what not to say and, and how not to treat people. I've seen them that were mad and aggravated at me and not long, not, it, it's been, you know, not long after I really, really got my feet in ministry that they, they put me on the radio down in Dayton and they put me on the radio and there was, a, there was a guy that came on after me and he started saying things like, you leave these young preachers alone, don't you listen to them. Well, I knew who he was talking about. I started getting phone calls. You listen to the preacher that comes on 15 minutes after you do? I said, yeah, I listen to him every once in a while. Well, you need to listen. He, you need to pay attention. He's telling everybody to discard them young preachers and hang on to the ones that have been in it for a long time. I finally got tired of it after about three weeks of listening to it on the radio every time my program went off. I finally went to the management. I said, Brad, listen, we got a problem. And I said, everybody near brother, and you know it too. He's talking about me. He looked at me and put his, put his hand on my shoulder. He said, Pastor Todd, he said, listen, young man, don't you worry about what people say. And you just keep sending us cassette tapes of your preaching for 15 minutes a day, Monday through Friday, and let God take care of him. What he ended up by saying, give some people enough rope, they'll hang themselves. I walked out there, I said, Brad, I will shut my mouth. I will not say a word, nor have I said a word. I will not throw stones back at him. I will not say anything. I will be respectful of the position of a pastor and ministry. I will honor that. I will never talk against the anointing. I will never run him down. I'll never say a word. I'll listen to what people say and I won't say a word. I won't say a thing about it. And to this day, I've learned my lesson that whether you like them or not, or, or, or whether you agree with them or not, or you have got to be careful what you say about that next generation or that last generation. Hallelujah. I'm going somewhere. Stay with me, saints of God. It was about two weeks later. I didn't say a word about it. I prayed about it. I gave it to God. I didn't complain to it. I never told anybody else about it. I just said, God, you got this and everybody sees it. And it wasn't two weeks later. It wasn't two weeks later, gone off the air. And he'd been on for years. I'm telling you, God knows what he's doing. When you put it in God's hands and you know that God's got his hand on your life, you've got a little confidence in the Lord that he's going to take care of you. You just learn to give it to him. But I've come across some sweet ones. I've come across some kind ones. I've come across some that invested in my life and gave me opportunities that were just unreal to most. I've been favored by God a lot of times in my lifetime. I've been blessed and I'm so very thankful and I never take it for granted. I never take the times for granted that God gave me the opportunity early on to be on television, from television to TBN. I'll never forget meeting Jan Crouch's sister. She took us backstage with the Crab family and Marthy Munizzi and, and um, I forget Jesse, uh, Jesse Dixon. He was with us in, in the limousine when, we, when they took us over to preach. I stood backstage with them in Atlanta, Georgia, and TBN, TBN, Nashville, Tennessee. I watched them. I watched what they said. I listened to how they prayed. I remember uh, meeting Pastor John Gray. Many of you know John Gray. I knew him when no one else knew who he was. I was just a young preacher standing backstage, and Pastor John Gray, who wasn't a pastor then, who did not preach at all for Joel Olstein yet, who walked in the back door, and my wife and I, he happened to walk by, and he heard Jill and I talking, and I said to Jill, I said, let's step out back, honey. Let's call the kids, I said. I'm missing the babies. And Jill said, I am too. Let's go call and check on them before service starts.
And he heard us saying that. And John Gray walked back in the building and we all stood around the Crab family. We were holding hands and we were getting ready to pray. And John Gray said, I just want to say something. I love this couple right here. I don't know them very well yet, but I heard them talking while I was walking through. And I just want to tell everybody, I love these people right here. I said, brother John, I love you too. He probably don't know who I am right now, but it doesn't matter. I'm just telling you where I've been and what I've seen. I've seen some incredible orators. I've seen great and met great authors. I've, I've been under the influence of incredible pastors. I've been in incredible camp meetings. I have been there in some of the greatest service at Dominion Camp Meeting with Pastor Parsley. I have, I, I have, now I wasn't sitting with him, but I'm just saying, Pastor Tommy had a way in and was sitting always in the third row. And he said, you just come be with me. And I said, in all them great camp meetings, R.W. Shambach, Brother Matt, you were there. Uh, Juanita Bynum, when she, when she preached on the, uh, uh, she preached on the oxen and the rocking cart and uh, I, I was there in all those services. I was there when Dwight Thompson was there. I was there when they had put, uh, Chairs all up and down the aisles. I mean, man, I have been in a, I have been in some sovereign moves of God. I mean, it's been incredible. It has been wonderful at such a young age in my 20s and 30s that God would allow me to just have a connection. Um, I, I, I really, at the time, it, it would just came natural. I wasn't trying to go anywhere. I wasn't trying to do anything. It's just God would give me favor with people. They'd call me up and say, I'm driving through. Come on, get with me. And you're going to go with me. I've watched God move. It's been incredible. And I think about incredible pastors that I've had to go to their funerals. I've had to help bury them. I've had to preach their services. I've had to love them. I've, I've had to go to nursing homes and see them when, when they were stalwart of a man and all of a sudden they didn't know who they were and they didn't know where they were and they didn't exactly know who I was. And I always thought to myself, one day, Todd Hoskins, you're going to be 80 if the Lord tarries. One day, Todd Hoskins, you might get to be 90 if the Lord tarries. And I always remember having such great respect, admiration, and love for ministers and ministers because I knew what it took. I watched them cry when they were in secret. I watched them cry over church people. I watched them hurt over church people. And I watched them get up in the pulpit like nothing just happened. Wipe their face before they walk in. Grab up that old King James Version Bible and throw it out on, on the, the pulpit and just start preaching on the prodigal son. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you, I've been there. I'm saying all that to say this, there is another generation that's coming and we have got to be responsible with this next generation. We are responsible to handle them correctly. We are responsible to love on them. We are responsible to encourage them. You will find in the book of Deuteronomy, and I touched on it this morning, that Moses said, I cannot go into the promised land. I cannot go there. God has told me. He's 120 years old. At 120, God takes him up on the mountain and speaks to him. He ends up dying. He can see good. His strength was not abated which means it had not left him. But he knew this is it for me. I'm going. God is going to take me. I can only view the promised land and I cannot walk in it. I'm telling you tonight, I believe if God comes back in our day, it won't be the case. But if he tarries another hundred years, which I don't think will happen, there are only things that we're going to see that this next generation is going to be able to experience. Speaking of this generation, I'm glad there's some people just outside of Nicholasville, Kentucky that are in a service in Asbury, in Asbury College right now and they are experiencing the presence of God. It is Super Bowl Sunday and they said, who cares? We're going to the house of God and we're going to stay because God's there. Woo! I'm telling you, saints of God, we are in a move of the Spirit of God in America right now. I can't help but say it just have a feel it. there's some trashy stuff that's going on television. There's some mess that's going on. And I'm not calling names now. I'm 
not giving the devil an ounce of credit because I'm telling you we all have the option not to watch it and not to preview it when it comes up on our social media and I have not thank you God but I've seen enough pictures of it to know that somebody is in trouble when a major network says we cannot wait to worship with you tonight you're either worshiping God or the devil and if they're not talking about God you tell me who they're talking about there is a young generation that's coming up right now that is hungry there's some dad and moms that are pushing the next generation right now you got a pastor that is pushing this next generation and I'm telling them to get a hold of the horns on the altar and cry out to God Woo! Moses' generation was a great generation. I look at Brother Ron Steckenfinger and I think about the Moses generation. I don't mean to tell you he's out of the Old Testament and still living and thousands of years old. But I'm telling you, I love Brother Ron Steckenfinger. When I see his white truck, now gray truck, that he still thinks can outrun my truck, which I totally don't agree with. He pulls that thing up and he gets out. He comes walking and I say, here comes the prophet. How young are you, Brother Ron? 85 years young this month. When I look at Brother Godby, when I look at Brother Godby that, that gave me multitudes, multitudes of blessing and help and engagements to preach for him. How young are you, Brother Godby? He'll be 90 next month. These are men of God that experienced revival before I ever was thought of, before my name was ever given. Brother Ron was, was instrumental in, in meeting with Brother Oral Roberts and almost had him at Hera Arena, if I'm not mistaken. You did have him at Hera Arena. Thank God I got that right just before I didn't. But imagine these great men of God, Brother Godby that's preached all over, Sister Godby, that's a fiery woman of God. Let me just tell you right now, Betty Jean Robinson told me, you never ask a woman her weight and never ask her her age. So I don't ask women their age, but she's somewhere way behind Brother Godby in years. But. She, She'll be 80 next January. She decided just to let it out of the, out of the bag. Hallelujah. That is that generation. That is that generation. There is something special about that generation. I think about some of the little ladies that come to church and sit over here. Oh, it's so fun to get in here a little bit. Of the, uh, Sunday night's the only time I come in a little bit early. And I walk in tonight and I see them like, like four little schoolgirls sitting over there. And they're just talking to one another and they're looking at their phones. And it's so special to see them just texting away. And I'm thinking, look at them precious little ladies. And I even said something to them tonight and to Sister Ann and to all those that are up through there. And Connie, you're supposed to sit over there and now you moved over here tonight. So I can, I'm getting to where I can't keep up with you anymore. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for that generation. I'm thankful for the, for the older generation that still comes to the house of God and trusts God and believes God. But now we've got this generation. It's 2023. So what are we going to do? Well, we got to pull the old generation back and we got to pull the young generation in and we got to get them all together. And the beautiful thing about it is when we get them all together, it's not a preference on what I drink. It's not a preference on what I eat. It is the Holy Ghost of God. That it, we do not have a high school Holy Ghost, a 90 year old Holy Ghost, or a 50 year old Holy Ghost. We've got a powerful Holy Ghost that wants to move in this generation. Woo. Oh, thank you, Lord. I said, thank you, Lord. Moses could not go where they were going. Moses could not go where they were going. There are young adults in this church that, cannot go, that are going where I can't go. <laughs> I know I'm in places they can't go, but I know they're going to places I can't go. They're reaching people that I might not be able to reach just yet until they get them full of God and bring them into the house. Which as a side note, let me tell you, I'm so tired of hearing everybody say, 
It's going to be a different revival in the last days. It's going to start outside the church. It's not going to go in the church. How in the world is God going to send revival and skip the church? The devil is a liar. Because when God gets a hold of people, they will want to come to the house of God. Revival is going to be in the house of God. This is his. I just got to tell it like it is. Yes, in foreign countries, it's going to be in the basement. In foreign countries, it's going to be in privacy. I'm telling you, it's the only way they can live. But when you talk about America, it is going to be in revival. You better believe I'm not going to let revival start in some park down the road and not start here. I'm not letting it start in the frozen peas by Kroger and not be in here. I'm not going to let it be underneath some tent somewhere and forget about the church. This is God's house. It's dedicated to him. His spirit flows in the place. We've got a cross on the building. Precious people in his pew and the Holy Ghost is welcome in his house we are that generation what did he leave us what did he leave us I'm going to tell you what Moses gave Joshua I'm going to tell you what he gave him here's what he gave he gave him words he gave him words Hallelujah, you go to college and you get, you get that little piece of paper we call diplomas and we get, uh, you know, we get these certain degrees and we go for our associates and our bachelor and our masters and our doctorate degree. And then we have varying degrees of education and those really, it, it costs quite a bit of money just to get a piece of paper and to say, I graduated. But it's what you got during the entire process. And what was it? What was it? It was words. Words of a professor that spoke to you that's going to help you make a lot of money when you graduate. What did Moses give Joshua before Moses said, I am going to die. This is as far as I can go. He gave Joshua words. Here's what he said. He didn't give him money. He didn't give him a place to stay necessarily. He didn't set him up in a lot of ways, but I'm going to tell you what he told him. He said, you are going to be moving. Things are going to be happening. And you need to understand something right now. When you go with what God tells you, you be strong and you be courageous. And I want to just kind of preach just for a moment here before we close tonight that we're going to have to be strong and we're, have, we're going to have to be courageous. What does it mean to be strong? It means not getting weak. It means not bending for every form of doctrine that comes floating by your pew. It means that you don't bend for everything that the world says you ought to dance to their tune. That you ought to move to their music. That you should bow to their worship. I'm telling you, saints of God, we're going to have to be strong. Strong enough to say, no, I'm not thinking like that. Strong enough to say, I'm not responding like that. Strong enough to say, I'm not doing it like that. Strong enough to say, I'm not believing it like that. Strong enough to say, I'm going to put my foot down. My kids are not going to be taught this bunch of junk. And watch this trashy stuff. Can I keep on preaching? We're going to have saints of God. Come on. Somebody get a backbone. Somebody stand up in the face of hell. And say enough is enough. Woo. You're going to have to learn to keep scrolling on your phone. <laughs> You're going to have to be strong enough to keep scrolling. You're going to have to be strong enough to change the channel. You're going to have to be strong enough to fast forward something. You're going to have to be strong enough. I was sitting on a plane coming back. We were about 30,000 feet and I, I slept some. And then I, I prayed and then I read quite a bit and I studied some more. And uh, just got one of those moments where I just wanted to just, just relax a minute. And I, I seen that they had free entertainment. So I pulled up my iPad, about 30 minutes left before we hit the ground, before we landed. And I, I got that iPad out and I got connected. The tech, technology got me connected to free entertainment. I thought, well, what's this gonna be like? And I got, I'm trying to find all the good shows and there's no rating on them. I'm trying to find all the good shows. And I finally got to one show and I thought, well, this kind of looks like an old timey movie. Maybe they'll have old timey standards. 
Well, they didn't. And within five minutes of that show being on, their stuff started flying out of their mouth. I had to be strong enough to say, well, I'm not watching this. Hallelujah. I got Jesus inside this vessel. Jesus lives in here. And I don't want him living on the inside of me hearing a bunch of trashy talk. Oh, I guess I'm being too old timey, aren't I? I guess I'm being too old fashioned now. I do not want to grieve the Holy Ghost that lives on the inside of my life. You're going to... Well, since you're getting so quiet, I'm just going to add five more minutes to this. I'm going to keep on preaching because I feel my help coming on. Some of us are going to have to be strong like Joshua. When everybody says, do it this way, you just stand and say, no, sir, that's not how we're doing it. When everybody else says that little bit ain't going to hurt you, that that little bit of cussing ain't going to hurt you, that little bit of nudity ain't going to hurt you, that little bit of love scene going on is not going to hurt you. Well, how much will, how much can you take in your bosom and not be burned? I'm going to keep on preaching if you'll help me. Last time I checked, it didn't take a big raging bonfire to burn my finger. All I had to do was flick a bick and put my finger up above that flame. And it gave me a good yell and a holler. Last time I found out all I had to do when I made some mahi-mahi yesterday and I put sliced potatoes in it and butter and sprayed some Pam on it, put some olive oil in there and then I've seasoned it up real good and a little brown sugar on top. And then after that I put a little green beans on the stove. I'm telling you, I knew right then and there, don't you reach and grab that pan that's got that hot mahi-mahi and those potatoes sliced real good. Oh, it looked delicious and it was. I went to pull that thing out of there and I had to get me, I had to get me some towels. Come on somebody. I had to make sure I grabbed that thing real careful because I knew it wasn't fire but it was hot and I'm not going to put my hand on it if it's hot Next, last time I checked when that burner on that stove was on and it cooked my green beans it said HS it meant hot surface it meant you better not put your hand here I believe there is an HS called the Holy Spirit and he's saying to you you better not get your hand in here you better not put your feet you better not get your eyes in here you'll get burned for it all Ain't nobody gonna help young pastor preach tonight. Woo! I'm working on a building. I'm working on a building. Saints of God, be strong. Then be courageous. Don't back down because of what it looks like. Don't back up because you hit a bump in the road. Stop it, saints. Come on. God called you to do it. Pray. He'll send the right people. Hallelujah. We get tired. Be courageous. Be courageous. Be courageous and know that God's hand is upon your life And that's exactly how he planned it. Hallelujah. And Moses spoke to him, said, I want you to be strong and I want you to be very courageous. And you find that in Joshua chapter one, all the way through verse number 11. It's amazing that not only did Moses tell him in Deuteronomy almost the identical thing and Joshua, he turns around and says, here is what I was told. Most common belief is Joshua wrote the book of Joshua. So it's from him telling his story about everything he went through. And boy, look what God did for Joshua. Look what God did for Joshua. And this is the Joshua generation. There are young adults that are in this church, young adults that are in this church that are pressing in. And let me challenge them because The more you press, the better it gets. The sweeter it feels. The deeper the anointing that flows in your life. But maintain a balance. As much as you read your Bible, get on your face and pray in the Spirit. And pray that God will fill you with His Spirit. Don't you just get educated with the Word and then not have any Spirit with it. Because that's where pride comes in. I know so much, but got no Spirit. 
but you have no spirit if you want proper English. Hallelujah. Stay with it, saints of God. Get in your word, you'll be blessed. Get in your prayer closet, you'll be blessed, but maintain the balance. This is the Joshua generation. And I believe that God knows exactly what we need. And it's no surprise to me what would go on national television. When anytime we Christians have anything to say, there's always a warning before the program starts. We do not endorse what they're going to say. What the, they might as well say what they're going to preach and what they're going to sing about. Our station has no connection, but we're taking their money. But you let this ungodly stuff go on without warning at all that somebody is about to do something real provocative, perverted, against God, against morals, and trying to get people to worship the devil. Might as well make it plain like in 1975 terminology. So, it's no surprise to me that God says, I got this. I'm going to send revival. And now in Asbury, when you read the details of what's going on, there are preachers that are going there that don't get special seats. You just go into an auditorium that looks like a large chapel with balconies on the left and right to the rear of the facility, and you go in there, no padded pews, theater wood seats. Let's go in there and have you a seat. Because this is directed by seemingly a bunch of young people that professors and those that are at the college are helping them to facilitate it. And they're just going in there and singing the music we sing by guitar. And there's no format. It's just when you get in there, everybody you talk to feels the spirit of the Lord. And when you read about it, it's people from other Christian colleges that are coming from Ohio and all over Kentucky and migrating in there because they want to see what's going on. And then I get a text from my daughter. Dad, I want to take these young people to Asbury College. <laughs> Come on. She didn't say, Dad, I want to take them skating on Friday night. They didn't say, Dad, I want to take them to a movie. Dad, I want to take them to a revival. Do you know if we got our young people there, they would probably never forget that experience. Never. And the beauty of it is, it's happening all day long. You just walk in. Miracles are happening all the time because someone decided to get hungry. And God said, I'm going to show my country something greater than what could happen in a four and a half minute song or whatever it was. Can we give God some praise? 